Grumpy Old Geeks, a weekly talk show hosted by Brian Schulmeister and Jason DeFilippo, discussing the finer points of what went wrong on the internet and who's to blame. Welcome to Grumpy Old Geeks. I'm Jason DeFilippo. And I'm Brian Schulmeister. We got some email from our Norwegian listeners. Yes, we did. Uh, uh, three of them, even. Three? I counted two. I, believe, I missed yes. one. Wow. <laughs> All right. Well, we have more than we thought. Uh, yeah, so Snoldus sent us in an email that is very long, but kind of described how the uh, the regulations work that we talked about last episode on the people who had to put in the label of, this image has been edited. Yes. Basically, it's just supposed to get uh, young girls. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but I do, I do, uh, I do like the, the last one here. Number five. I agree. Fuck Norway. <laughs> you, you live there. <laughs> I personally believe this that this ice-ridden hellhole should be closed down and evacuated every year between October and April. The summers are occasionally quite nice, though. Not nearly enough to make up for the rest of the year, but worth mentioning. And don't even get me started on the price of alcohol. Anywho, love the show. Keep grumping on. Well, <laughs> I got to say that if the price of alcohol is high up there, that's not good because you need it for <laughs> those those dark days. Those dark days. Of those winter. chilly nights. Yes. Yes. Those very long ones. So I got to say, Brian, I think the internet has a new, uh, hey, man, will you help me move? Or, yo, dude, can you give me a ride to the airport? Oh, it does? Those questions that we all love to get from our friends that we are we yes. cringe when you get them because you try and find a way to say no. <laughs> going live in five minutes. Hey, I'm going live now. Hey, check out my live stream now. I'm going live. <laughs> I get those all day long now. All day. I think it might be a bit of a self-selecting sample in terms of the people you follow there, Jason. It could be. It could be. And now I feel guilty because I did it, <laughs> you know, when I was doing the Adorama <laughs> show. I kind of feel, I feel a little, little dirty now. But every time I see that, I'm just like, oh, man, really? It's, it's just a little well, guilt you know, bomb. Like we've discussed, uh, the internet now is an on-demand situation, not a live situation. Yet the metrics still require, please, for the love of God, if you want to keep doing a show, you need more than three people there. I know. I know. <laughs> Especially on Twitch. Where you can't even monetize unless you've had at least five people chatting at one time. Yeah. And good luck getting five people in a room at one time at this point. I know. I know. My first my first live stream went out. Literally, the reach with all the quote-unquote influencers and friends that uh, retweeted the links and everything about my live show, like, you know, 30 people showed up. And the reach was yeah. well over a quarter million people. So <laughs> you, do, you run the numbers on that one. Right. Not good. The news. So, Brian, I don't know if you've turned on the news lately, but uh, Austin Powers has kind of made it into space. Yeah, baby. Which one's Austin Powers? Uh, that would be Richard Branson, the actual one that flew. <laughs> oh, OK. There you go. Yes. He didn't quite cross the Carmen line, but, uh, you know, rich people just say, well, it's spacey, space enough. It's space ish. You know, it's better than the Carmen San Diego line. That's true, because you could never yeah. find it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, I've watched the news. I heard he made it to wherever he made it. And, you know, there was some snark that he didn't really make it anywhere. And, uh, yeah, good good on them, I guess. There's an awful lot of backlash. Oh, yeah, we'll talk about that. We've got lots of that in the show today. <laughs> It'll be fun. <laughs> uh, Bezos is getting ready to do his thing, uh, go uh, go deeper into the Black Void. I think he's going to 60 miles, which actually does cross the Carmen line, but we'll see. But you never know. They may have a, a rapid, unscheduled redistribution of wealth uh, on that one. So who knows? I'm not too worried. They're going to be packed in Amazon boxes with lots of, uh, of that uh, plastic bubble wrap. So it'll land fine. Yeah, it just might be three days late and at the neighbor's house. When you want it. No, that's, that's okay. Yep. <laughs> so, you know, he's going to have grandma and baby bro on board. So we'll see how that goes. But, you know, their big selling point is look at the size of our windows. <laughs> you know why supersonic vehicles actually have small windows? So they don't blow out and explode. Yes. That's kind of kind of funny. And I just think it's funny that Musk is just kind of kicking back, sort of, and just watching you know, everybody else do it. He did, uh, he, he did, uh, book a trip on Virgin Galactic, but I think that might've just been a press play. I don't think he's ever going to go. Do you? There's no exact date. So when you're playing this game, you give the date if you're really going. Actually, Virgin Galactic doesn't even have a date for their actual first paying customers to go up. 
So true. That's fair. So he can. I don't know. We'll see. I I can see Musk going. Um, I can see him. You know, token taking a big bong rip right before he puts on his helmet. <laughs> they should get Rogan on there too. They could do a podcast from space. <sighs> If they get Rogan on there, just keep that thing going. Yeah, seriously. Can you put a little more gas in the tank? <laughs> yeah. And then, like I said, there is quite a lot of backlash. I saw I saw two things on Twitter that actually really made me chuckle. The first is uh, science is in such a sad state that 52 years after landing a man on the moon, people are getting excited about a billionaire reaching the Earth's upper atmosphere. And the other one, which really kind of hits home to most people, oh, hey, the billionaire tax evader who asked his employees to take eight weeks of unpaid leave during COVID made it to space before the billionaire whose employees rely on food stamps and pee in bottles. Pretty cool system we've got here. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> so back down here on Earth, um, Biden has uh, taken over the executive order pen from Trump, except you can actually read his name and there's stuff on it and he doesn't wave it around the room. And he's put out a big, uh, wide-ranging executive order for big tech, net neutrality, and more. So we'll see. He's going to sign the new executive order, or actually he already did a couple days ago, that will establish a whole-of-government effort to promote competition in the American economy. In other words, it's targeting anti-competitive practices across, across a wide range of industry, which includes internet services and tech. There are 72 proposals and actions involved in this. Uh, a lot of it is to get... Uh, Undo the things that the Trump administration did, particularly with the FCC and net neutrality. So we'll see what happens there. A um, bunch of boring blah, 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 blah things in there. But we'll see. <laughs> I mean, this sounds interesting. Uh, it's something, right? <laughs> yeah, I think he still needs to get somebody else on the FCC board before anything can really happen. So he's got to pick somebody and get them on there. So that'll be good. Um, yep. Some right to repair stuff. There's, there's a whole yep. bunch of stuff in here that's uh, actually pretty good. We'll see how it how it plays out. But uh, yeah, yeah, the net neutrality thing is the one thing that I think that us and all of our listeners really care about the most. Well, I think right to repair is a big deal. Like uh, we talked about it a bit on the show a couple of years back when there was kind of a push for it, and then you know, obviously there was four years of holy shit, we got bigger fish to fry here. Um, yeah, but right to back... repair our democracy is what we were worried about. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's a, that's kind of a big deal and it's going to change the way that all uh, Apple's going to have to look at their business model if this stuff goes through. And, and I fully support it. I think it's great. I'm not sure how much DIY repairs we can actually do anymore because these, these devices are so fucking complicated and the pieces are all so tiny and they're all put together in such intricate, massive ways. But on the larger perspective, I think it's a good thing. And the, the idea that companies would have to keep this in mind while developing new products, I think is a great thing. Plus, you know, it, it also would stop Google from doing things like, oh, I don't know, hiding microphones in their devices, and not telling people. Yeah. No, but it's not turned on, Brian. We promise. We but promise. But it's not turned on, right? No, yeah. it's just there for, you know, future, future expansion. Future, so whatever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I think a lot of the stuff, especially with Apple stuff, it's, you know, the right to repair thing for that really comes down to mom and pop shops because you do need specialized equipment to take these things yeah. apart and put them back together, you know, but y you can get it, you know, it's not super duper expensive. Go to Shenzhen, Shenzhen and Shenzhen, whatever the fuck name of it is uh, in China. And there's people in malls with little kiosks that'll do it there right there for you, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. so it is it is doable. So we'll see. But Apple's been getting better, I think, with... Uh, I think so. I mean, yeah. I, the past couple of times that I've had anything wrong with one of my phones or iPads or my wife's, I've I've gone to the local you fix it shop and they take care of things pretty quick and pretty cheap. Yeah, because what it came down to before with them was the ability, like the availability of parts for these mom mm -hmm. and pop shops and getting certified on the actual equipment. So uh, here's, here's hoping. Fingers crossed. Yeah. And uh, speaking of uh, right to repair our democracy, Trump's back in the news. Because he's <sighs> suing everybody. Uh, well, it's it's for show. The whole thing's for show. So, well, yeah. the The best analysis I heard the other day. I was I was listening to the radio. I can't even remember what station. It was probably NPR. So go ahead and call me a, a liberal because I am whatever. Uh, but they had a lawyer on, and and they asked, "Well, what is the biggest? Uh, what's the biggest obstacle for for Donald Trump with these lawsuits?" And the lawyer just said, "Well, the law." Because <laughs> Zing! Because he's suing for something that the, the, the law's against him. <laughs> yeah, it's it's ridiculous. But you know, he's fundraising on top of it, so of course he is. Yeah, because he's going to run again. Actually, you know, he's going to be back in in August or October or whatever or shadow government or whatever. Who knows? 
who knows who cares go away <sighs> yeah. go the fuck away I saw this one. I thought it was pretty funny. Black Mirror in real life. Facebook now owns and is developing a city. They should have just mm-hmm. called it the circle, but they're going to call it Willow Village. Willow <laughs> Village. Oh, okay. isn't doesn't that just, you know, warm the cockles of your heart? It's very little house on the prairie. Mm-hmm. Except with 24 hour surveillance and ping pong tables and free beverages and everything like that. It's Good just- night, suck. Good night, Sanders. <laughs> Oh, can you come tuck me in, Cheryl, please? <laughs> Look, this is straight out of like Gibson-esque sci-fi. This is this is like the, the corporations basically walling off themselves from the world. Everybody lives in here, everybody eats in here, everybody dies in here. It's you're not American anymore, you're Facebookian. Well, I mean, this is this isn't even Gibsonian. This goes back to, you know, the thirties and forties and fifties with company towns. You know, mm-hmm. this is not a new concept. You know, you'd get a uh, script that you can only spend in the company town when you work for the company. They pay you in it. You spend have housing. all the money at the company store. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. So it's not a new idea, but it's one that, uh, I mean, they're throwing Hail Marys now because everybody's quitting everybody else. And it's like <laughs> they have a hard time keeping people around, I guess. So let's put them in a walled garden. <laughs> one good way to keep people around in is uh, you give them a nice apartment that's rent free. Yep. Or yep. seems to be rent free. Seems to be, yeah. Yes, I, I mean I, they really got to call them panopticondos just to just because. <laughs> I know you coined that one. <laughs> I know that's just fun. And speaking of people quitting and leaving and moving out of big cities, there have been a study. Now we we have talked about this, and everybody was saying some have suggested that remote workers, now that they don't have to go to their offices in big cities, could move to and revitalize beleaguered cities and towns in the heartland, bringing their big paychecks and big spending. We talked about that a lot on the show over the last year and a half, and we've also talked about how those big paychecks will actually become smaller because they'll be adjusted for cost of living in the places that they're living, if that even happens. However, it's not happening. So, Okay. There's a new report from the Brookings Institution's Metropolitan Policy Program. People did not move from the coastal cities to the Midwest in any meaningful way. Um, they may have done so for a time just to move home with their parents to save money and things like that. Uh, But now that cities are back, people are coming back to them. Everybody is coming back. There is some movement, but the movement has been to suburbs rather than downtown areas. Yeah. Uh, So, you know, if you're now only working two to three three days a week in an office, you can live in the suburb and do that commute. And it isn't quite as bad as it was before. And you get the more space. And if you're planning to have a family, you've got the yard and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So cities aren't dead. They're just they're just expanding and sprawling out even further. Yeah, they just went sploosh. That's about mm-hmm. it. <laughs> yeah, I don't see many people uh, rushing to go to Des Moines from New York no, or something. No, that didn't happen. No. Yeah. Uh, in the, the fantasy world of, you know, tech writers, it did for a little while. But now we have proof it didn't. And uh, in the realm of bad ideas, this one is right up there at the top. Uh, TikTok now wants you to send your resumes, video resumes to get a job. So, okay. uh, what could possibly go wrong with this? Because, you know, yeah, uh, TikTok is not really a place where you discuss your master thesis about why you're a qualified candidate for a job. It's where you do fart jokes and dance moves and pranks on your friends and tell really bad jokes. So, I was about to say, is there a resume dance that I'm not aware of? It's got to be one of those little trip hop dance things that, you know, that everybody does. And, you you know, gotta, that's that's probably it. Got to do a backflip over your briefcase. Yeah, those little dance troops and shit like that are the only people that are going to get resume. It's going to be bad. <laughs> you know, it's it's like you want to you want to hide your social interaction some point until you get the job. Yeah. I, I Yeah. You don't want your job. You don't want your potential future boss to see your tiktok feed right away you know you got to ease into that (laughs) it's like hey i'm a really good candidate Uh, and then all they have to do is just click on your name and see all the dumbassery that you've done for the entire pandemic you know if if this does go out it really needs to come with a wipe my history uh button which of course they charge you twenty dollars for well luckily it seems like tiktok might be doing that for you. So if if your dumb fuckery in the past related to uh, violence or nudity or sex, uh, they've got a new AI tool that's going to be pulling all that stuff. So nice. they're, they're doing a little whitewashing for you. You know, 
I was thinking about this when I saw this article. They're in the best place to possibly do this because their matching algorithm is so good. Yep. All they have to do is point that at really terrible videos with, you know, exactly what they're talking about, violence, nudity, anything that's, you know, in the terms. And they can probably train that AI to be just damn near perfect. We, we might have a net police here, Jason. We might. Especially since, as we've discussed, they're now selling their tech and their AI. Um, you know, They do have the best tools. They have the best automation. They have the best machine learning about this stuff. If YouTube really wants to fix itself or Twitter or Facebook, maybe they should be buying this tool that they're about to roll out. Yes. Yes, they should. Because now after a Mozilla investigation, they found that YouTube is recommending videos that violate their very own policies. <laughs> Didn't need to do an investigation. I could have told you that. Yeah. All you have to do is turn on YouTube. Use the service. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's working as planned. Yeah, this is in the, the no shit Sherlock department. YouTube is terrible at this. They've always been terrible at this. So By design, I might add. Yeah, really. It's all yeah. about engagement, people. It's all about engagement. Mm -hmm. I did find it funny that uh, the research found that people in non-English speaking countries are far more likely to encounter disturbing videos. Uh, yeah, because they don't hire yeah. locals to help train things. And, you know, I'm sure it's all English all the way down, you know, from the engineering perspective, at least. Right. There you have it. And something that we've been talking about for two years, we get to at least have a brief pause talking about after two years, the Amazon's legal feud with the U.S. government over the Pentagon's decision to award Microsoft the $10 billion cloud contract, a.k.a. Jedi, is over, finally. Yeah. <sighs> Finally. Until it starts again. Well, no. I mean, now now they're, they're going to come back and the Department of Defense is going to say, here, you get a slice and you get a slice. So Amazon's yes. going to get some. Microsoft is going to get some. No mention of Google in there anywhere, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I actually I, think it's a really great idea that they're splitting it up over the two companies. You know, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah, it's called a spoff. You don't want to have a mm -hmm. spoff when you're dealing with, you know, top sensitive government materials, I guess. Or at least, you know, government military infrastructure. Right. So that's good. And uh, no canoes is good canoes is how I like to call this one. Rupert Murdoch's answer to Google News is dead after only 18 months. I read this headline. And I was like, oh, good. Rupert Murdoch's dead. Oh, no, damn. I know. Sadly not. Sadly <laughs> not. So I don't know if you ever heard of this site. It was called Canoes. It's probably nope. pronounced news, but it was K-N-E-W-Z. So it was a news aggregator, kind of like Google News. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it finally shut down. And there are a couple of reasons for it. One, and I love this, their farewell message said, we certainly had provenance, but no profits. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it turns out they ended up doing a bunch of side deals with... Uh, other companies that uh, turned them profitable for their news. So they just shut the site down and said, we're going to call it a day. I just find it okay. funny that nobody had, I know that, but, I mean, it was a conservative version of Google news, sort of. Right. But, sort of. you know, there were a lot of uh, things from the wall street journal and the New York times in there because they were supposedly fair and balanced, but yeah, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, good riddance. <laughs> Everyone needs a world-class VPN. Grumpy Old Geeks recommends private internet access to protect your online privacy and identity. Private internet access never keeps any records of their users' online activities, so you can be assured that you have complete privacy and nobody knows what you're doing online. No matter your technical skills, private internet access is one of the easiest VPN apps out there. All it takes to connect is just one click or tap and your data will be encrypted instantly. With just one private internet access VPN subscription, you can connect up to 10 devices at the same time. Go to GOG.show slash VPN and sign up today. For a limited time only, you can get our favorite VPN for just $2.69 a month when you sign up for two years. GOG.show slash VPN. That's GOG.show slash VPN. <laughs> Andy wrote in, hey, Grumps, I know you're always looking for something new to check out to watch. Uh, check out Wayne on Amazon Prime. It's John Wick meets John Hughes. Imagine a teenage version of SNL's Chad raised in South Boston with a perchance to solve problems with violence. Uh, wasn't that gross point blank? Yeah, could have been. I, I didn't like that yeah. movie. I barely remember it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, as I've gotten older, I really don't care about the John Hughes movies anymore. They were perfect at that time in my life. But yeah, also Ready Player Two. 
kind of ruined me on John Hughes as well. <laughs> Such a horrible storyline. That's true. And uh, Tony from Australia also wrote in, being only a recent listener, I'm not sure if you've covered Halt and Catch Fire, a drama series about the computer industry in the 80s. If you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend adding to your binge list. Uh, we have talked about it, and I could not get into it. I couldn't get past the first episode. I couldn't get past the first five minutes. I know everybody <laughs> said that it was, you know, good, but it was just way too over-dramatized for me. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. yeah no I, thanks. That wasn't my thing either. Yeah. So. Uh, I finished Star Wars Rebels. I am sad that it's over. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was so much better than the last six movies we've gotten. All right. That's not hard. So. <laughs> Not no low bar, but it was great. I really enjoyed it. Um, monsters at work. Now I talked about this a while ago, and I, I love the monsters movies. And mm -hmm. my kid, you know, I watched them because the kid and all that. But they're phenomenal movies. I really enjoyed both of them. And they had had, had announced that we're going to get a third movie. Monsters at Work is coming. Turns out, not a movie. We're getting a whole series. Oh, uh, a couple episodes are out already, and they're just as fun as the movies were. Oh, good. Really happy about it. Good. Yeah. Who who uh, who are the main characters in this? Uh, same ones. You got, oh. you got all the, all the big, big people have returned. Oh, so. nice. I might actually yeah. have to watch that. <laughs> no, the they, did, they didn't cheap out there. They've got, they've got all the real people back. So it's, you know, they got Disney money, man. Yeah. That's really, it's like, yeah, this is, this and is it, what happens when you have work. all the monies. <laughs> it's a, it's VO work. This is not a hard, hard push for these people. No, not at all. They probably all, you know, they're all rich enough that they have studio. They probably don't even have to leave their house. They go into a room. I'm sure they have it all set up at home. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, The Witcher season two has announced that it is coming and will hit Netflix on December 17th. I really did enjoy that first season, so I'm looking forward to this. OK, yeah, I, I might go back and watch it because, uh, yeah, you said it was good. I, I like your opinion some of the times, so maybe yeah. I'll check it out. <laughs> you know, it's a it's a watered down Game of Thrones. OK, well, I mean, <laughs> after after the ending of Game of Thrones, you know, I don't know if that's a compliment or not. <laughs> so. Oh God, that was, oh, that was so bad. Anyway, yeah. Black Widow came out, speaking of big Disney money, and uh, they made a shit ton of cash on this of flick, they did. but the real, the real winner here is that they made uh, over $60 million on people spending $30 to buy it at home. So that's 2 million people mm -hmm. ponied up 30 bucks to sit in their home and watch it on the, you know, release day. So mm -hmm. I, it's point set match. There's no excuse anymore to not have simultaneous releases. I know it's different for different types of movies and things like that, but you know, some people just don't want to go to the theater. I hate the theater. I hate people. I hate popcorn because it smells like feet. I just want to sit at home and not have to worry about the guy behind me talking and farting and eating his chips. Um, I hate dying from a virus. Ah, eh, I'm back. Yeah, I'm good. So. <laughs> I don't give a shit about that. I just hate yeah, people. Yeah, no, I mean, this, uh, uh, yes, it changes the paradigm and everything and all of that. But the, I agree. There's no reason not to have a simultaneous release now. If people want to go see it in the theater, they will. If they don't, you're still getting 30 bucks. Yeah. And, you know, that's, and you don't even have to split that with the theaters anymore. So, yeah. I go. did not watch the movie. Did you? No. No. Yeah, I I'm, don't care. I'm done. But I'm done with the MCU for the superhero movies for the most part. But uh, I see the next item in our list here. And let's talk about that. Yes, that would be for the most part. I, I at your recommendation, I went ahead and watched uh, an episode of Loki and then immediately watched a second episode of Loki because it's good. It's great. And it's not <laughs> stupid fucking MCU tight pants things. <laughs> yeah, no, I really, really, really love this show. I, I I finished episode five. I, I watch it as soon as it comes out. So I, that's my my Wednesday treat when it comes. I just wish it was longer, but I think the shorter format actually makes it tighter and better. But yeah, I think so, too. And, and it's, it's very clever. It's very funny. And uh, that's what actually makes it, you know, and, and there there are some big questions in there, which I like, you know, the exploring the nature of the universe and time itself. Like it, it's smart and it's clever and it's not just people in spandex running around and flying and beating each other up. Right. Um, the yeah. nice part about it, too, is they thought about this from the get go. They're like, we don't want to just do the basic time travel crap that everybody else has done. We really want this to be different. And I mm -hmm. think they pulled it off. I really do. Yeah. So far, so good. I like it. Yep. And I saw this and I just had to laugh. Barry Diller says streaming services killed the movie business as he knew it because he's an yes. old fart. And uh, <laughs> I love it. These streaming services have been making something that they call, quote unquote, movies. And uh, they ain't movies. They are some weird algorithmic process that has created things that last 100 minutes or so. 
Um, well, uh, Barry, listen yeah, to me Barry. for a second here, Barry. <laughs> Barry, um, Barry, Barry, Barry. You're, you're, you're in media, right? Um, there's this whole other part of media called music. Have you taken a look at that industry over the last 20 years? <laughs> did you not see this coming to years? Yeah. I was we all did. Thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Barry, it's time to take your bags of money and just go retire. Seriously. I mean, yeah. he's run studio, big studios. He ran Paramount for a while. I wasn't there when he was there, but, uh, um, but yeah, he's had his time in the sun. And I have to say that from everything I know from, at least from an audience perspective, I'm happy with the way things are going as a it, creators, more creators have more opportunities to make algorithmically generated movies at this point than any time in, you know, history crews mm -hmm. are getting hired more. It's, it's, I think it's a net win with everything that they're doing with, I don't care if it's algorithmically processed or what. I mean, I think it is too. And, and I think the, the real struggle, which we've seen in the music industry as well, the, re the real struggle for, for media companies in general is going to be, okay, yes, there's going to be the crap and the crap is going to make the most money. Uh, we got to figure out how to funnel some of the, the big crap money uh, to the smaller projects that are actually really good. And, you know, that's, that's the, that's the challenge that's going on in the music industry right now. And the, the movie industry and TV, that that's what they're going to have to figure out too. You know, it, it's the old school, the old school record label model, you know, the, the big band, the Britney Spears, you take all that money, you put it in a pool and you use, you're supposed to use that money to fund the smaller bands. And that's yeah. what the movie industry needs to do too. Yeah. And it's, I think it's great. I mean, we, we have been quote unquote in the golden age of television for the past decade. Look at all the mm -hmm. great shows that have been made, you know? So yeah, I hope it, I hope it continues. So mm -hmm. all good. And I did watch summer of soul on Hulu of all places. Mm -hmm. This will be the last thing I watch on Hulu because I'm canceling my Spotify account and <laughs> with it goes the Hulu. Um, right. It was fantastic. It's a, a quest love joint. Uh, what it basically is, it's kind of like it's the Woodstock of Harlem. And yeah. the footage of this has sat in a basement for 50 years. And they pulled it out. They, you know, remastered it, restored it. Uh, I, and we figured, you know, we were joking because my, my roommate comes from the music industry. And she's like, how the hell did they get the rights to all this for this movie? This is amazing. And I'm like, that's where all the Hulu money goes, probably, to get the rights mm -hmm. to all the music. It was phenomenal. It was absolutely phenomenal. I loved it. Have you had a chance yeah. to check it out? I did. It was amazing. It was just flat out amazing. And I love, I love the fact how it just ties in right now to what's going on in the world. Because as this was going on, we landed a man on the moon. And yep. everybody in Harlem was just like, who gives a shit? You guys put some crackers on the moon, but we don't have crackers to eat. So what the hell's going on here? And, you know, and now with all the backlash to the billionaires going up into space. It, it's, it's, it's a really nice juxtaposition of the times back then and now. And, uh, and I, I posted a picture here in the notes, which I'm sure you'll probably use at some point on the socials. Uh, Richard mm -hmm. Branson uh, juxtaposed with the, uh, the tent cities flying by. And yeah, I'm not sure exactly which tent city it, that is, but it could very well just be the one that's about uh, five, six blocks from me on four Street. I know it could be. It very well mm -hmm. it probably is. <laughs> Uh, and I want to be clear, though, you know, there is a big difference between what happened back then and what's happening now, because back then NASA was spending taxpayer money to put people on the moon. And this is just private rich guys, you know, getting their rocks off. And yeah, it would be mm -hmm. fantastic if they gave a shit about what's happening down here. But they are under no obligation to do anything that they don't want to with their money, except mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe pay some damn taxes. That would be nice. Yeah, I could. I was about to say, I think, you know, if we wanted to go that route, I could probably argue with you about that. They are under extreme obligation to do so, but that would be a whole different show. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just I, it, pay your taxes so we can do with it what we need to do with it. I'm fine mm -hmm. with at, at, Once you pay your taxes, go to the moon, go to Mars, go to Uranus and be an anus. I don't care. Actually, I would like you to go to Mars or Uranus and just leave us the hell alone. Mm -hmm. But, you know, rich guys doing rich things are always going to be around. But uh, yep. Andrew Carnegie building libraries, you, sir, are not. Anyway, um, I, saw, I saw this and I thought it was just hilarious. Exclusive TED Chats are coming to Clubhouse. A, All right. Clubhouse is still a thing. B, well. TED is still a thing. <laughs> 
Ted is so watered down their brand. It's unbelievable. And oh. this is just another another move on their part and another desperate Hail Mary from Clubhouse to get any press. Yeah. You know, um, Ted's going to be allowed to run ads on their 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 Clubhouse uh, and not give anything back to Clubhouse because the Clubhouse just needs the press, honestly. Yep. Ted is huge with the Ted Radio Hour because it's just distributed everywhere. But, I mean, once they went to TEDx... Every yep. influencer douchebag with a rehashed idea got a TED talk and yep. I'm sorry, a TED X talk. Now, if people get a TED talk, there's actually some, some cachet that comes with actually doing a TED talk, but TED X talk is just something you can put on your LinkedIn resume. <laughs> exactly. Look, I went to one. I, I, I was working with somebody for a while who uh, had a side gig that was really involved with, um, some different environmental things and he had a TEDx talk and he mm -hmm. invited me to it. And I was, and this is way before, you know, TEDx really watered down the whole brand. And I was like, Ooh, a TEDx talk. That's interesting. Of course I'll come. There were three other people there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Brian, you and I can do a TEDx event. We could do TEDx. Of grow. course we can. You just got to yeah. follow the guidelines and anybody can do one. And yeah. that's the, that's the problem. That's where they watered their brand down. When they first started doing it, I thought it was a great idea but then they just let every schmuck on the planet with a yeah. video camera do one. And it's like... Oh. There was no vetting. No. So this is going to be a big fail. And speaking of other failed things, I watched something on Peacock this week. I actually signed up for Peacock to watch one show. Okay. Uh, I watched Epstein's Shadow, Ghislaine Maxwell. Ugh. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's same shit, different show. You know, it honestly was the same stuff that I've seen on right. all the other Epstein, you know... Uh, documentaries. Uh, so I went ahead and immediately canceled it, but that doesn't mean I still don't get the emails every 10 seconds because mm -hmm. apparently you can cancel your account, but you can't cancel the emails. Oh, by the way, I'm not, what am I thinking? No, you can't cancel the account. You can go to a <laughs> free account where you can get a subset of the content, but try and find a cancel button. It's going to take you more time than it's worth. So yep. uh, that's why Google has created email filters. This has anything with the word peacock, <laughs> delete immediately. But yeah, that uh, the the content on peacock is just it's reruns, it's NBC reruns yeah. that I don't care about. Um, I do have one though. Finally, for our friends in Norway, an old show called Lilyhammer with mm -hmm. uh, Stephen Van Zandt. He played a gangster on the run that was hiding out up there in Lilyhammer, Norway. Uh, they right. did only did three seasons of it. I talked about this on the show, like because I mean we were new when this was coming out. Um, mm -hmm. I think it ran from 2011 or 12 to 14 or something. Um, I loved it. I always loved that show. I was sad when they canceled it, but uh, yeah, it's worth, it's worth watching. It's a really fun and you know, little Steven is a pretty good gangster. He's a pretty good actor. I have to say, and it was a funny show. He was in Sopranos too, wasn't he? Yeah, I think he was. Yeah. Yeah. He had a couple bit parts in there, but uh, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed Lilyhammer. And one thing that I can say is, after watching that show, I'm never going to Norway. <laughs> Ups and doodads. Brian, in my attempt to wrangle the hedonic treadmill of reward and sadness and happiness, I found mm -hmm. something new to keep me keep me happy. Last okay. week, last week I went into uh, into a, a funk when my iPad Pro. Uh, ran out of space because I usually get them with, you know, 64 gig of RAM or a gig of space mm -hmm. on it to just to, right. just to be able to use it, have apps and stuff like that. And I keep running out of space on it. And I'm like, OK, let's let's do the trade in trick. Let's see how much I'd get for this one to get a new one. And I looked up the new one with a terabyte. I'm like, ooh, let's go big. Let's go big. And it was a two thousand dollar iPad. And I'm like, that's ridiculous. But they yeah. do last forever. And then I checked mm -hmm. and I, I'm like, okay, what's the resale on this? If I trade my other one in, it was like 600 bucks. I'm like, okay, well, that brings it down to 14. And then I can do the Apple card payment plan, which only brings it down to $150 a month for a year. I'm like, oh, that's an extra hour of work a month per, you know, for the rest of the year. And then I get my shiny new iPad. So I ordered it. Then I was happy. I was ecstatic. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm getting a new iPad. And then the next morning, I'm like, why am I going to spend this much money on an iPad that I use about four hours a week? Payment regret. Yep. And here's the fun part. I canceled it and I got just as much joy from canceling it as I did from buying it. So here's the trick. You are an odd man. Don't buy anything that ships immediately and you can get double your pleasure by buying it and canceling it. 
in, 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 in 48 hours. So it was fantastic. I felt great. I felt great when I bought it. I'm like, yay, new iPad. Ah, <sighs> that sucks. Uh, cancel. Yay. I saved money. <laughs> The Apple Store algorithm is just going to start popping up a little window when you buy something new and say, step away, Jason, you're drunk. Uh, they're just going to put it, they're going to send me the thing that it's <laughs> like, you know, in the queue and they're just going to put it off to the side and say, he'll be back tomorrow. Because <laughs> eventually I do buy some stuff. But uh, yeah, I found this great little Chrome extension because I was feeling nostalgic. It's called Throbber. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it... Uh, it, it sadly the uh, the menu bars on modern browsers are very narrow now. They're very tiny. You don't get big icons like you used to. But yeah. Throbber puts the little Netscape loading icon in your bar, so when you're loading a page, you get to see the stars fly by the N. That's it. That's all it <laughs> does. I want to try and hack it and put in the the original alpha version of Netscape, the throbbing, the th real throbbing N, where the name comes from. Mm -hmm. But that takes work, and I don't really have that much yeah, time you're not on my hands. No, I'm not. But hey, what are you going to do? And uh, Tony from Australia wrote in, love your show. I've been listening for about two years, but this is my first time commenting and donating. I vaguely remember a listener recently asking about problems opening old Word or WordPerfect files. I have a similar problem, and today I was ferreting through a box of old software CDs and found a copy of Windows XP and Office 97. I managed to load Windows into a virtual machine and install Office. Problem solved. See, I love this. I love this. The mm -hmm. only problem is he found CDs. Who the fuck has a CD drive anymore? Well, Tony from Australia. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> uh, I use Parallels and Parallels 16 mm -hmm. is out right now. And uh, which is interesting because it's every time I used to go into Parallels, I'd use it like three times a year. And every time I'd go in, there'd be a new version. That's where they're on 16 now and didn't do much else, but. Speed improvements, blah, 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 upgrade. I'm like, okay, might as well do it now because I'll have to do it later and then it'll cost me more. And now I just have a fucking subscription. I'm like, just keep it up to date. I don't care. Uh, but you and can. I, I follow the general rule of if I haven't needed a file for 20 years, I don't need it now. No, but I use I use Windows for other things that, that I need for my job for testing stuff. Um, just to see how things look on different Windows apps for podcasts and stuff like that. So every now and again, it comes in handy. Uh, and on my uh, Super Ding Dong MacBook Pro, it actually runs really fast in Windows, so you can kind of play stream on it and play games. But mm -hmm. that's neither here nor there. Uh, but the thing is, it's like a lot of people would just go download a version of Windows XP from you know a torrent site and go from there. And I'm like, okay, well that just comes pre-hacked, so you can't do that. But if you do have Parallels, there is a there is a one-click install Windows button, and you can get a developer version to run Windows 10 in like five minutes, which is great. But, All right. Um, it's just a fun, it's a fun app. And, you know, I have Kali Linux running on it too, for those times when I get nostalgic and pop into it and go, yeah, this is, has given me PTSD. I'm out of here. <laughs> out of here. But that also made me think of uh, the other app that I always have to update whenever I log in is ScreenFlow. ScreenFlow Pro, right. it used to be called ScreenFlow Pro, uh, which is a screen capture utility for the Mac. And it, it's also got a pretty nice video editing setup in there. So if you don't want to learn Premiere or uh, Final Cut and you just want to do quick videos, it comes in really handy. And I use it every week now because we post videos on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And that's the program I use to rip out the, the audio and the video to post up to YouTube. Uh, if you've never used it and you need some screen recording software on your Mac, it is hands down the best. And also, I like it for just straight up video editing. It's much easier than most of the big ones. There's not that many options, which makes it fantastic. And it's cheaper. It's like 150 bucks. So, right. Good stuff. But speaking of videos, I found this this morning and I wanted to get your read on this one. Does your video need a better soundtrack? Ask an AI to write one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a new app called Dinoscore. And mm -hmm. what they did was they trained it on a bunch of different songs and then learned how to break it apart. And then you can put in different points where you want the tempo to change or things like that. It takes yep. it, it remixes it and gives you a royalty free version that you can then use in any project. Yep. So you sign, you sign up, you get uh, 20 songs for free just to try it out. And then after that, for personal use, it's 20 bucks a month for unlimited songs. I, right. I downloaded it and I tried it this morning Mm -hmm. It's really fucking good. It's really it, it, it's good. It's what I would call good enough. It is absolutely good enough. 
for and yeah you know that that's fine that's fine you're putting together a tiktok video and you want some music to go along with it great go ahead and use something like this that that's great it's this stuff is getting really really good i'm not gonna lie but here's the paragraph that leapt out of this wired article at me (laughs) okay i think it's incredible says professional videographer joseph d de giovanni who spent months testing the software before its release the truth is the playing field has 100 percent been leveled he says the kid with the cell phone is up for the same job at vogue that i am you've spent your year, your life doing this <laughs> studying it knowing how it works and now you've got to compete with a kid with a cell phone that basically has never studied anything welcome Great. to our that's, world <laughs> welcome to the world yeah. that we live in now that's it and it's true that's it it's absolutely and true. it is true Yep. So why spend money licensing music when you don't have to? I mean, for different projects, you definitely want, you know, bespoke music when you can get it. But mm-hmm. I mean, even for a lot of the big name projects that I work on for podcasts and they just need like an opening theme, they'll spend 50 bucks and go get it from one of the, you know, one of the main music sites. Look, I, I want to again say, and we just talked about this with Barry Diller uh, a little bit earlier, music is a bellwether and nobody seems to give a fuck when the musicians get screwed or the music industry gets screwed. But what you don't understand, people, and you need to start paying attention to is music goes first. You follow. There will be outcry when there's AI that puts the actors in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we we, <laughs> we, we have that already. It's called deep fakes. Yeah. And people are fucking pissed off about it. Exactly. Music? Yeah, fuck them. <laughs> yep. And, and, you know, there's already places that are doing algorithmic voices that can take over our job, too. So yep, it's all coming down <laughs> to the AI. Woo. Pretty soon, we're all just going to be sitting on a couch getting our UBI and eating our Soylent Green. I'm down. Fuck it. I'm over it. I don't want to work <laughs> anymore. Give me that UBI. At the library. I was uh, rooting around for something new to read, and uh, I just uh, I, I, I just searched and searched, and the algorithm threw up a couple things, and I saw something called "There is no anti memetics division." And it, uh, interesting cover, interesting blurb. The author was given as QNTM. Obviously, that is millennial for quantum. Mm-hmm. So that gave me pause because I'm like, oh fuck, what's this going to be all about? So uh, I downloaded the sample from from the kindle library and i read through the sample uh and then i did a quick google on quantum Quantum, quantum. to see who he was and quantum is sam hughes who explains i also write under the name qntm but goodreads doesn't allow one author to have multiple pen names since when did you make your decision based on goodreads that nobody uses anymore (laughs) seriously (laughs) uh Uh, So his bio goes on. I'm a writer and software developer. I invented and discovered anti-memes. I wrote raw, fine structure, the difference, blah, 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 some other books. He's enthusiastic about time, time zones, time travels, and calendars. I think Unicode is the best thing in computers, and I believe that correctly structuring and normalizing data is an important social issue. Blah, blah, blah. That's somebody I'm going to invite to my fucking dinner party, I tell you right now. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's also somebody that you may not want to read books by because I am as thoroughly geeky as they come i am an ex-programmer i've been into sci-fi all my life this this sample of even the book was so fucking up its own ass look how clever i am i'm a fucking programmer and developer i love computers more than i love people that i couldn't take it (laughs) i don't know what he writes under his real name and if it's better sci-fi he seems to have some accolades as far as that goes but i will be avoiding the QNTM books from now on. I could have, I could have told you right now. Just looking at the end, the last the last sentence tells you everything you need to know about this person and why you should never <laughs> listen to a word he says. I love JavaScript and I don't care who knows. No <laughs> sane person on this planet loves JavaScript. Period. Yep. I'm right. surprised he's got uh, four and a half stars with 1,235 ratings though. Yeah, I, I, it was an intriguing concept, but I just couldn't handle the writing. So okay. we'll see. I, like I said, I, I will go back and give his his nom de plume, his real name, Sam Hughes, and the books he writes under that name. I might give that a go and see if it's any different. Who knows? Stick with the sample. Because there, you think there has to be a reason. Why would you use two different pen names? Yeah, so. maybe this is his avant-garde type of stuff. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of what I'm thinking. So to wash the taste out of my mouth from that and and desperation and three glasses of wine, I discovered that one of the authors that I read a lot, Matthew Mather, had a new book out called Polar Vortex. Matthew Mather writes the kind of what I lovingly call shitter sci-fi, 
nothing terribly groundbreaking is ever going to happen. It's just going to be a straightforward sci-fi story. And as every single book under his pen, on, under his name on Amazon says, every single one of his books is in development by a Hollywood studio, which just means that the studio tossed him five to ten grand to hold the rights to it. That doesn't mean it's actually in development. Yeah. And because I have yet to see a movie based on any of his books, and I've been hearing that all of his books are in development for about ten years now. We call that so. optioning. Being optioned yes. is not the same as being in development. It's not the same as being in development at all. So uh, <laughs> most of his books have been optioned. And uh, even though this book is relatively brand new, this one, of course, is also in development by a major Hollywood studio. Optioned. <laughs> uh, optioned. And I have to say, this book sucked. Uh, I've enjoyed a- <laughs> That's why it's in development by Hollywood. Yeah, uh, I have enjoyed an awful lot of his books. I've thought they've been pretty clever and, and fast-paced and like, Good shit or sci-fi reads. Uh, this one was not. Uh, this moves slowly. I don't understand what the point was that they were going to get to. There wasn't terribly. There wasn't a real sci-fi kick to this one at all. It was. Uh, yeah, plane goes down. People have to figure out. There's, there's a who done it on the plane about why it may have happened, and it, none of it. Just in, it, I just didn't give a shit about, at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to get that vibe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I finished it. I finished the book because at the end, I wanted to know the whodunit part and what happened. And it was so unsatisfying even at the end. Ah, oh, I need a good book. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, uh, I read How to Live by Derek Sivers. Derek's an interesting cat. You know, he's the guy that created CD Baby. And yep. uh, um, there's a, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of contradicting ideas about how he lives his life and things like that. It's a fun read. There's some things in there that I agree with. There's a lot of things that I don't agree with. This is one of those books, and I, I'm noticing this from people who become quote unquote post economic. You know, the people that I don't know are rich and don't have to do shit anymore, but still want to do something. Yeah. Um, like one chapter is get rich. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Yeah. Well, says if, the if rich we could guy. Do that part <laughs> <laughs> says the rich guy. Perfect. But there were some there were some fun bits in there. I mean, I like Derek. I I enjoyed the book. It was a fun little read. Um, you know took him two years to write it but uh i i i and like i said i'm i'm half in half out with it just because of the if he'd have left out the get rich chapter i'd have had much <laughs> more respect for the actual book itself because it right. just it yeah. brings into sharp relief how rich he is and i mean he's not he super did not, rich but no, i was about to say he did not get rich enough to, to launch himself out into space no so, he didn't which and, is what the super rich do yeah and and to his credit when he sold cd baby he kept enough money to keep him comfortable for the rest of his life and then he took the rest of the money and put it into a trust for um music education so yeah you know which is good that's like why that. that's why i like the guy he's got you know he's got a lot of cred for doing that um so that's cool. But uh, I, I recommend picking it up. He's got a bunch of other books that I really like. Uh, is it Hell No or Yes? And uh, one on the music industry, too, which is kind of interesting, but also goes to people who are creating their own content, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But, um, like I said, I really like Derek. I, I recommend signing up for his newsletter. He only does it like once a year. So it's, it's an easy read. <laughs> <laughs> then I started reading Do Nothing, How to Break Away from Overworking, Overdoing and Underliving by Celeste Headley. I never knew she wrote this book. I know Celeste, uh, she was on the Jordan Harbinger show one time and uh, I talked to her every now and again on Twitter. And uh, uh, for the most part, I really like it. The, there's a lot of really dry stuff about the history of work and how the 40 hour work week came to be and how now we have the 80 hour work week because we're just kind of dumb and want to work dumb. more. <laughs> yeah, it's really what it comes down to. The history, mm-hmm. though, the history is actually quite fascinating, even though it's a little bit dry. It is very fascinating on how, you know, in the past, we never used to do this. We never used to do this until the industrial age when, you know, and, you know, time is money coined by Ben Franklin. And uh, although that is sugarcoating it a little bit, because unless you were a uh, nobility, uh, you in the olden days, you work 24 seven to, to survive. Well, see, that's the thing. It's, that's not actually true. Uh, I reckon I, you should, you should give it a listen uh, or I mean a read. I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot. Yeah, you don't I will, do that. I will read it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Celeste was an, she was an NPR host for a long time and, uh, uh, she's, she's a smart woman, very smart woman. And, uh, the research that she did is, you know, top notch. So she's an actual journalist, believe it or not. Uh, so it's, right. I, I recommend it. I'm not finished with it. I just picked it up the other day. So I'm about halfway through, but I, I mean, a lot of the concepts are something that I've been working on for 
you know, the past like six months about working less and enjoying things more and doing things for no fucking reason at all and having fun. Like adding an iPad to your cart and purchasing it and canceling it the next morning. That was great. I love that. That is the best thing I've done all week. (laughs) I'm telling (laughs) you, man, you have no idea the elation I got from canceling that thing. It's awesome. Uh, But yeah, it's fun. And of course, on deck now is the ugly truth or an ugly truth inside Facebook's battle for domination. I've heard a couple of interviews with the two ladies who wrote this. They are New York Times reporters. And uh, I'm sure that the conclusion is going to be Zuckerberg's a dick. (laughs) We kind of know that already. uh but they are the guests on the pivot podcast that came out this morning, which I will be listening to on my bike ride. And I have a feeling that the interview that they do there is probably all I'm going to need from this book. It's a good interview. I listened to it already. Okay. So, yeah. um, but I had this, I had this, this, I had this in my list before I, I listened to the interview, but it's a, it's a good interview. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to get it and read it because they've got so many interviews with so many people that it's really going to be kind of fun, you know, cool. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. It's a hate read. It is a hate read. It's an absolute yeah. hate read. It's a hate read, and it's uh, it's going to back up every single thought that you've had the whole time, so it makes you feel better about yourself. I actually just feel good that I'm going to give these ladies some money. That's, yeah. you know, they get a quarter from <laughs> me. So, right. But that's why. Moron of the week. Now, this one, Brian, is a head scratcher. I don't know what they're thinking. But Bill Cosby wants to do a comedy tour now that he's out of the Who's Cow. Of course he wants to do one. And he's going to make a docuseries, too. Five-parter. You know what? I've got an idea for him. You know know how, uh, uh, you know, performers that reach a certain stature, they get a little sick of going out on the road. They don't want to travel so much. They do a residency in Las Vegas. I can see Cosby doing a residency at (laughs) Mar-a-Lago. There we go. Those are the only fucking people that want to see this douche. And every night, drinks are free for all the women. That's right. All the time. Women drink free. You go down one hall, you end up in Trump's room. You go down the other hall, you end up in Cosby's Cosby's room. room. (laughs) If only Epstein were still around. You could have a (laughs) three-way. The residents could have been on on Rape Island. That would have been exactly where it goes. Perfect. I'd watch that show. Uh, And I thought this one was just too funny. Have you ever heard of a website called Tumix? I have not. I didn't think so because it's mostly anime, but they do, you know, web cartoons, web tunes. Um, they are on the... How do uh, they do that without Flash? I know. <laughs> I know. Um, so they are they are very big on the, uh, the anti-piracy side of things, and they're always sending down takedown notices. Now, in true mm-hmm. moron of the week, you know, <laughs> Hall of Famers, they actually asked Google to remove infringing URLs from their own website. That's right. Nice. How awesome is that? They need to purchase TikTok's AI. Yes, they do. Security? Ha! Dave Bittner is back. Dave is the host of the Cyberwire podcast, co-host of the Social Engineering Podcast, Hacking Humans with Joe Kerrigan, co-host of Caveat with Ben Yellen, where they discuss law and policy, as well as surveillance and privacy. And finally, he's the co-host of Recorded Future, where he takes you inside the world of cyber threat intelligence. Welcome, Dave. One breath. Ah. I want to hear that at two speed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes me want to go out and send something via FedEx. I was going to say, I was trying to do the FedEx guy. <laughs> Boy, that's an old school reference that probably half the people in our audience won't know. Well, the, the old, the, go, the grumpy old geeks will totally know yes, what that means, yes, right? Yes, they will get that. <laughs> and the grumpy old Southern California geeks will remember Frederated commercials, which also did the same thing. So. You guys remember Joey Suzu? Oh, yeah. I saw, oh, yeah. I, saw, oh, yeah. I saw a Joey Suzu doppelganger the other day, and I'm like, wait a minute, he's dead. Oh, wait, so that's not him. Never mind. Oh. <laughs> Moving on. Huh. Interesting. Well, speaking of cars, yes. before we dig into uh, security stuff today, I wanted to touch base with you guys about cars. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically, I'm curious to know what your relationship has been with fast cars, like sports cars, exotic cars. When you were a kid growing up, you know, a young man, were there, were, do you have any recollection of the first car that caught your fancy that made you go, ooh, that's, now that's a... That's well, a car I want someday. Uh, growing up in Los Angeles with a top speed of 10 miles per hour on any freeway, um, <laughs> fast cars, not so much. Uh, disturbingly enough, I think my first like, oh, that's cool, was the General Lee. 
which uh-huh, you know uh-huh. that that yep. show has been canceled multiple times at this point yep. i'm sure yeah uh and of course kit from knight rider was the pinnacle of coolness uh um, yep. as a child yep. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you, you do your thing where a Lamborghini is obviously the, the posters and whatnot, but I, I personally, I've never really passed that, you know, six, seven, eight year old period, uh, or age, um, uh, cars have never really been that big of a deal to me. Mm-hmm. What about you, Jason? I would have to say the bandits trans am. Yeah. Yeah. That's I mine too. One. I think I think I missed that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, that that was younger. definitely the that was the first one for me. Mm-hmm. In fact, um, to the point where I remember uh, a buddy of mine in middle school was telling me about this new TV show he'd seen called Knight Rider, and how the uh, the hero drove a Trans Am, and I was like, oh yeah, Trans Am, that's cool. He said one of the new Trans Ams. I was like, oh, exactly. <laughs> I had the same reaction. I'm like, what is this happy horse shit? <laughs> right, right, right. But eventually they won me over, and yes, yeah. Kit was pretty cool, and I certainly like you know I, I have a thing for Kit. And well, the reason I ask is um, I would say in my certainly in my adult years I have been more of a wolf's and sheep clothing kind of guy. Where if I were well, going we already to know a, about your furry thing. <laughs> yeah, we, that's been covered ad nauseum. We right? established that. that. I know. That's not. Tell me something you don't know. So. <laughs> Oh, boy. Oh, paging Dr. Freud. Dr. Freud. <laughs> paging Dr. Freud. Um, so uh, I would have preferred, uh, for example, like a BMW M5, you know, something that looks to all the world like just a regular four-door sedan, but under mm-hmm. the hood is a high-performance car. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Mercedes I was going to say, I have few... the dad version, the X3. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, yep. There, exactly, exactly. You're right, yeah. right. And today, everything has to be an SUV. Um, yeah. uh, Mercedes has made some wagons that were ridiculously high performance. You know, so that mm-hmm. kind of thing has always been uh, more attractive to me than, for example, lusting after a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or something like that. Although right. uh, I have DeLoreans. So you, cool. you like the German cars. I do like the German cars, yes. Uh, I, I, I have to admit, I've always wanted a Porsche. I mean, that is kind of a... I'm not a big car guy, but had I lived in a place where one could do such things and had the space for an extra car that does not matter, I, I, a Porsche would be very cool. Yeah. I say I, I really liked the 944 when it was in 16 Candles. <laughs> uh, as we all did, but um, I, I, and the 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 shape of the nine eleven never really did it for me. I, as mm-hmm. these days, I I certainly appreciate the nine eleven, and I have friends who have them and have driven them, and I've driven them, and they're they're wonderful. But that's not it. Doesn't move me. It doesn't. I don't feel emotional uh, when I see a nine eleven. I can certainly right. appreciate them. But I say all this to bring me to the point of my story, which is that yesterday. I was uh, stopping by my parents' house to visit my folks. They were having some computer issues. And as we all know— Did someone leave a Mercedes uh, with a sign that said, please take me? (laughs) Because I thought we had covered this and you had learned your lesson, Dave. Uh, Yes, this is why this is my one phone call that I'm burning uh, to do this show with you right now. Patreon.com slash GOG for Bittner's Bail Fund. Right, so— I had stopped by the store on my way to buy my mom some flowers because I'm a good son, right? And mm-hmm. outside the the uh, floral shop was one of the new Corvettes. Oh, yeah. The 20... Oh, yeah. So I saw one drive by the other day. They look like Lamborghinis. They do. Yes. And I have to say this car moves me. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I never if if you said to me in a million years, Dave, would you ever be interested in a Corvette? I would laugh at you. I'd be like, ha, what am I, Sam Malone? No, I'm not interested in a Corvette. That's a that is not at all me in any way, shape, or form. Not not my. So kind. you're I, you're looking for European style with shitty American execution. Well, let's not forget price. Yes, <laughs> I'm looking at the prices <laughs> well, there now. Is price, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So that's I think that's part of it is that you've got this mid-engine supercar look to it, mm-hmm. but it is achievable. Like if I if I you know I could probably stretch and and uh, well I guess if if uh, young Jack decided he wasn't going to college, there's probably a way I could make it happen. <laughs> but uh, 
Or you do seven or eight more poor co- podcasts and you're right there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. But then I wouldn't have any time to drive it. Anyway, I, 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 I'm as surprised as, as anyone by how this car moves me and how I look at it and I go, oh, my God, I want that. I, and, I, and and it makes no sense because where would I drive it? Like, as you said, I mean, where can you drive a car like that anywhere today? The roads are so full. Uh, also, there are potholes everywhere. Yeah, our crumbling infrastructure right. also doesn't help. <laughs> right. You don't want to take yeah. it over a bridge because God knows. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's it's a it's sort of a, a folly thing to even think about. But I, I was just I, I surprised myself with uh, thinking about how much for whatever reason. <laughs> the look of this car just it it makes me feel something, um, and uh, I, I would say if uh, any of our listeners have an opinion about this, write it down on a piece of paper, put it in the glove box of a 2022 Corvette Stingray, and leave it in the parking <laughs> lot outside of CyberWire headquarters, <laughs> just to, and put the keys under the front seat, and I will go out and I will I will read that note and enjoy uh, driving that car. So. Uh, midlife crisis much a lot of uh, you know that's the other thing right right yeah i mean that's you know and i'm sure my wife would say something like well you know could have been worse it could have got a girlfriend or something mm-hmm. like that you exactly know, like... <laughs> <laughs> well who do you think yes, i'm picking so. up in the stingray honey <laughs> lesson right. for all the wives I, out there let them get the car yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think this uh, for me this is such a uh example of my rational side of my brain versus uh that side of the brain that somehow just wants this thing. And uh, it's definitely so a sign that uh you are are diving headlong into middle age as well because that is the uh <laughs> you know we we do start to reach back to the things that moved us as children and uh, uh they they resurge in our brains a little bit as we realize know, that but, uh, uh, we have reached a point where uh you know we're not going to be able to change our lives too much anymore and no. we are on a clear path and here we go sliding into death right right, right. <laughs> right. And Brian you're Odds the you're the I'm... young one it's it, as you get closer and Brian, <laughs> Dave has passed the 50 mm. mark and I am yes. I am, I am there in like a Three weeks. I understand, right. Dave. I understand yeah. very well where you're coming from. There ain't there ain't much time left to have fun, so we'll fuck it. Let's go. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And as the recollect or the realization sets in that chances are I will never be a professional athlete. Uh <laughs> <laughs> God, that hits me all the time now. Is like, as my wife and I are like, we were watching the All Star, uh, the the whatever the the home run tournament the other night, um, yeah, and a little bit, and like they talked about the grizzled veteran that is still hanging in there at thirty six. Mm, right, <laughs> I'm like, oh Jesus, <laughs> yeah, I know, no, it's a real thing. But uh, part of me is mad at myself for falling into such an obvious stereotype as as being attracted to a sports car. <laughs> In my midlife. Like, come on. I, am I better than that? Evidently, I am not. I am not. Well, let's so, take a, we, give yourself a pat on the back here, Dave, because your first obsession with a, was with a full Stormtrooper outfit. So, you know. This is a, this is a step in the right direction. <laughs> you you, you know came what, out of though? the gate hard and odd. So now yeah. you're just going a little more mainstream. Yeah. yeah, but imagine how good I would look in the Stormtrooper outfit in the Corvette. Oh. Yeah, and the black and white would... one definitely would match. <laughs> I, I would kill for the photos. I really would. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, well, listen, guys, thanks for having me on this week. Uh, sure thing. <laughs> What's the name of that uh, car show that was so popular? Top the Gear. Clank and Clank show or whatever they were called. <laughs> oh, Car Talk, yeah. Exactly. Car Talk, yeah. We'll be back. All right, Exactly. You've wasted another hour listening to Grumpy Old Geeks. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm looking. This thing's got 490 horsepower. I had Who's a counting. I had a 510 horsepower 300 ZX. It, it, wow. it was heavily modified, and uh, yeah, that thing tried to kill me every minute of every day. So <laughs> honestly, if you do drive one, be very careful. Be very, very careful. <laughs> Right. That's the other thing. I don't need to introduce an additional way to die into my life. <laughs> we have plenty of them right? already. It's called getting out of bed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. It's like every time I sneeze, I'm like, is this the sneeze that's going to throw my back out? You know. But so... then to, to your earlier point, Jason, do, do you want to die from a sneeze or do you want to die in a blaze of glory, Thelma and Louise style going over a bridge as it collapses? I am going that's Thelma true. and Louise because I pulled my shoulder out <laughs> with, a, with a trowel putting like a little potted plant in the ground this week. So, you know, mm-hmm. I am, 
I'm like, yeah. yeah, let's just let's say screw it and let's go. I'll get a matching one, Dave. I could probably make it over that drawbridge. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the thing. <laughs> We can rent All right. Them. Next week, let's do a cocaine <laughs> show. Come on, yes. kids. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, if, I mean, if it's your last hurrah, just rent one. Screw it. <laughs> you don't have to buy it. Well, that's true. Yeah, that's okay. right. I guess I'm not getting my deposit back. Oh, yeah. well. <laughs> Shucks. Sorry, <Yeah>. Chad. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. Oh, well. Shall we do okay. some security then? Sure thing. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I guess. That was more fun. Back to the normal boring. <laughs> hey, at least it wasn't Star Wars. We did slide a little bit in there, but I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Um, so Audacity, that really horrible audio program that a lot of newbies use because uh, it's free. <laughs> is It was great when it first came out. Audacity 1.0, given the, the competitive software at the time, was actually really good. Okay. Uh, let's give him credit for that. Okay. And it was mm. written in Java back then. Yay. Um, on a PC, it, like I got to say, on a PC, it worked. On a Mac, no, no, it was terrible. Yeah, well, I was a PC user back then, so yeah. it was a very good piece of software at the time, given you had a PC. Yeah. It's been shit since then. Don't get me wrong. Well, it's gotten even worse, because Audacity 3.0 <laughs> is now owned by a Russian company called the Muse Group. Not to be confused with the Muse Bush. Not to be confused <laughs> with the group Muse. <laughs> yes, that either. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, they've added a whole bunch of things in there that are making a lot of people upset, including uh, phoning home to Mother Russia, uh, mm -hmm. sending user data back and, uh, you know, telemetry on your machine, your IP address, your configuration and things like that. They've changed the license. So um, and, and kids under 13 are not allowed to download it anymore. Uh, there's all sorts of fun things that are happening with it. And okay. uh, it so be, be sure be not to better. record. Be sure not to record your top secret uh, military B2B podcast that's only meant for distribution within the military uh, with this program. Yes, definitely yeah. not. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, but I think uh, a big part of this story is just how people lost their stuff when they heard this. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> it, even though it's crappy, it is popular. It is a popular program because huh? it's it free. It is popular, but I think... But my point is that people overreacted, I think. I, I think the initial fear that this that they'd completely turn this program into spyware and so you ha could no longer use it and get it off your computer, a bit overstated. Are uh, you telling me the internet overreacted, Dave? I know it's hard to believe, Brian, but it's true <laughs> in this case. Um, and uh, so I think cooler heads have since prevailed, and it's mm -hmm. primarily they updated their – eula to match really whatever the rest of their software their right EULA. well yeah. but yeah. it's just it's it's a lot of boilerplate stuff that says should we choose to do this we you grant us the permission to do this which everything right. says these days they they yeah. cover all their bases there's some other issues though uh, with the developers since it was open source and it's still technically yep. kind of open source they are taking a very draconian approach to uh, contributors to the project saying that they now own the code and can do with it what they mm. will. You still own a license, but you're giving them a perpetual, you know, full use license to it as well, which I uh, can see ruffling that, feathers. That's true, right? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, it's their software. They bought it. Yeah. They own it. Yeah. They can do uh, what they wish with it. I've seen, I mean, has there's been some talk of that someone could fork it, right? I mean, so that's what they're talking about now. Yeah. Is to, to do a fork and revert it back to uh, pre Muse days. And uh, mm -hmm. just fixing it, which open source, go for it. Um, and apparently they are in breach of the the licensing that they're using because they have added those things with uh, the 13 year olds and such <laughs> like. So, mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of time, like the 13 year old thing, a lot of a lot of that is sort of preemptive GDPR stuff. Exactly. Just, you're yeah, not even supposed to be on Facebook trouble. if you're under 13. So, right. <laughs> yeah. right. <laughs> right. Now, Jason, I don't know that I have ever opened Audacity. Well, don't. What about it? Uh, <laughs> what about it sucks? What, why? Why in particular do you not like it? Oh, uh, just the interface is terrible. It's absolutely The interface terrible. is very like l early 90s. Yeah. And they've okay. never updated uh, it because it is open source and a bunch of coders are doing the design on it. Um, it's... I mean, like I said, I haven't used it in quite some time because I don't want to. I, I'm still uh -huh. pretty sure that it is just a waveform editor, a destructive waveform editor. It's not uh, non-destructive, which, mm. you know, as a professional, you can't do anything that's 
not non destructive. Um, right. So as a thing, I know a lot of people that use it because they're um, the filters that they have for removing noise from vinyl. Uh, that's ninety percent of the people I know that use Audacity, like rip their vinyl and use the filters to get rid of the pops and the scratches. That's I see. the main thing because they do have huh. a lot of built-in it, filters. It also has a good filter to actually put pops and scratches back in, which is the one time that I actually use it for something because I wanted to make a piece <laughs> of MP3 audio sound like it was playing off vinyl. Oh my god! I got well. I, speak. You just you reminded me of something. Uh, we had another garage sale the other day, and the girl that runs the garage sale for us brought a bunch of stuff over, and I ended up buying something from her. Uh, she had a mint condition General Electric tape recorder. Like the old school tape recorder. Oh, that's cool. Oh, wow. Uh, mint condition. Uh, like I checked the battery compartment because that's where they usually are crap. You know, somebody had leaky batteries. Whistle clean. Uh, works like a charm. So now I have a classic cassette recorder. So if anybody knows hmm. where the hell I can find a cassette, <laughs> let me know. I was, just about, <laughs> I was just about to say, so in about two months, if you want to swing by Jason's house, you'll be picking up a brand new tape recorder. <laughs> uh, that's going That's going on the, on the wall of old crap. So... <laughs> Um, that, that goes with my old film Nikon cameras. I'll put that up with that stuff as a display <laughs> item, but I, I wanted to, I want to try cause it comes with a microphone and everything. I'm just like, Ooh, you might be able to get some good sounding stuff. Or now I guess I could just use audacity and throw the filter on it and make it sound like a exactly. player. <laughs> mm-hmm. Just add some hiss. Yeah. Pretty sure logic can do that. I think I've probably got a filter for that already, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, I thought you guys would get a kick out of that. I'll take a picture of it and <laughs> post it somewhere. Yeah. Now, uh, Dave, I don't know if you guys covered this next one, but I thought it was kind of interesting. Cyber attack disrupts Iran's national railway system. Did you uh, did you guys cover this one at all? We did. Was we it did. a big thing uh, or was it a tempest in a teapot? I think it was a big thing if you were in Iran. Yeah, uh, probably so. Waiting yeah. to get a pl- <laughs> if you were waiting for a train to get somewhere. Yeah, yeah. then your day was ruined. Yeah. I mean, everything's <laughs> relative, right? Um <laughs> I think uh, the big thing about this is it starts the conversation of who done it, and the two most likely suspects are either Israel or the U.S. Of course. So I just didn't know if anything else came out because I saw this when it first happened, and I didn't know if there were any uh, big news bombs since then, or if it was still like, yeah, we don't no. know who did it. I haven't seen any signs of attribution, um, and uh, I haven't really, other than this initial report that you've that you've got here, which is basically what we reported on that um, you know they got that the trains weren't running. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Other than that, I've seen no real follow up on it. Because this you now know, this is this... a major infrastructure attack. Well, well yeah. I was going to ask: Is this train system like the Chinese uh, train system that we discussed a few uh, months <laughs> Run back, <on> Flash. <laughs> uh, running on a a hacked version of Flash still because Flash was discontinued and they had to create their own Flash server to keep the trains running? I don't know. That's a good question. I I really I don't have a clear sense for uh, what kind of infrastructure they have on Iran's system. That's another thing I really haven't seen reported with this. A uh, story, but you're right. I mean, it's a it's a good point. There's a there's a, a wide spectrum of um, <laughs> of infrastructure around the world. And people, <laughs> yes. many of these are held together. We think ours are bad, and they are. But a lot of these are held together with uh, bailing wire and spit and tape and and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, definitely. So this comes from Alan Liska, who is uh, one of the researchers over at Recorded Future. Um, He actually has written a book on ransomware, so kind of knows what he's talking about when it comes to this stuff. But he tweeted this morning that all of the R Evil sites, all of their infrastructure appears to have gone offline at about 1 a.m. Eastern time, which, wait for it, is 8 a.m. in Moscow. So. Ah. Uh, it showed up if, with your badges and couldn't get in the door. <laughs> it's as if, yeah, it's uh, as if st- at the start of the day, uh, it got shut down. Now, of course, what we don't know is what was the cause of this. It could have been it could be a temporary thing. It could be a system failure. Um, they could be running off with the money. It uh, could be an exit scam. Could be that the Russian authorities told them to just lay low for a while. Could be that the Russian authorities have said, okay, we're done here. Um, could be that the U.S. or another one of our allies reached in and, and took some action on our own. Interesting um, timing after the Biden-Putin summit in which Biden basically said, you guys better fucking knock it off. 
That's right. That's right. And it's interesting to see the speculation of uh, InfoSec people who it seems like what they're wishing for is that we went in and turned the lights off ourselves, we being the U.S., rather than President Putin telling them to knock it off. Right. They, I think people are hungry for a demonstration of capabilities um, rather than a diplomatic uh, sort of um, giving in to our wishes. So I don't know. I personally always kind of uh, prefer the diplomatic solutions, but okay. Well, sure. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I agree. I for, mean, for, overall, for the it, world, it's the best thing. But it's, it's more interesting that we have Team some, six. Come on. A little bit of right. war hawking going on from our InfoSec community here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, you know, we, the, the thing is when you when you demonstrate a capability, you burn that capability. Now the bad yeah. guys know what you're able to do. So that's a big reason why we don't like to do that. Um, but uh, I think, I don't know, my sense is that I think people are tired of... Um, the Seeing Russians, all the losses and no wins. Well, yeah, and the Russians sort of crying wolf of saying, oh, is, is that us? Or I guess crying bear in this case, saying, oh, is that, that wasn't us. We don't know any, we don't know what you're talking about. This is, we're, we, we uh, respect the rule of law and uh, surely this is someone else. So, I don't know. I think people are ready to have it, uh, have something decisive happen and, and, um, not having a smoking hole in the ground, this could be the next best thing <laughs> right. for a lot of folks out there. I, I, I'm with you. I think uh, a diplomatic uh, solution is probably best and probably will lead to the best long-term outcomes. But, mm -hmm. yeah, it seems like a lot of people are uh, smelling blood in the water. I'm sure right. you guys can figure out which side I'm on. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a guess. <laughs> Burn him to the ground. <laughs> you want a smoking hole inside the smoking hole. In exactly. The <laughs> I want, I, I, after they drop the 10,000 pound bomb, I want a 20,000 pound bomb right behind it. Let's go. <laughs> right. Yeah. Absolutely. Take that rootin' tootin' Putin. <laughs> And this is why I'm often glad you didn't go into politics, Jason. There you go. Well, I yeah. did. It only yeah. lasted five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> One campaign rally and everybody's like, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. Wow. What? Yeah. Be careful what you ask for. This guy wants to bomb Reseda. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Have you been to Reseda lately? It could use some cleansing. Actually, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you're going to bomb something. <laughs> yeah. Okay, gents. All right, guys. Well, <laughs> I need to run along. I have an appointment at the local Chevy dealer. So, uh, <laughs> you 100% need to go take yeah. it for a test drive. Got to go to. Yeah, you know what? And the thing is, like, I guess that's the one good thing about being a middle-aged guy is that nobody's going to question my desire to take a, a test drive of this thing, right? It's, nope. They're going to they're, they're gonna see me walk in the door and they're going to say, the Corvette is right over here, sir. Yes. yes. <laughs> As opposed to, you know, 19-year-old version of you that would show up with wanting a test drive. Uh, no. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Dave, you are, you are squarely out, in what they call the target market. I am. <laughs> Absolutely. Desperate Absolutely. enough to want it and rich enough to afford it. Yep. Yep. All right, guys. Good catching up. I'll talk to you guys next time. Closing shout outs. Over at Patreon, no new subscribers. Boo. 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 And over at PayPal, <laughs> we've got Simon, Andrew, Breed, Ralph, Miles, Mark, Linda, Natalie, Tony, and Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. No new iTunes reviews. Nobody. Uh, and over at our tip jar, we got a couple people, but uh, Jason knows these stories since there's quotes. Uh, Justin T gave us a double. Woohoo! Thank you, oh. Justin. Uh, Thank and you. Peter, Peter, uh, H Peter. says, uh, he says, fuck you and fuck Stripe for not letting me add a comment to my $5 donation. Uh, he's a listener from Norway. So thank you wow, very see? much. I guess if we insult countries, we get, uh, we get actual uh, feedback from them. So fuck you, Sweden. Well, that's no, that's how we got our Swedish listeners already. <laughs> Oh, shit. Okay, we're going to need another country. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's case hey, in point. That's we, the only reason we've got such a big group of awesome Let's finish our triptych up there. Fuck you, Denmark. Yeah, fuck you, Denmark. And <laughs> Anne Q also uh, donated to the tip jar. Thank you very much. 
Thank you all so much. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Until next time, I'm Brian Schulmeister. And I'm Jason DeFilippo. Thanks for listening to Grumpy Old Geeks. If you enjoyed the show, visit GOG.show slash donate to help us keep the lights on and we'll love you forever. You can also help us out by sharing the show with your friends and enemies. It's easy and absolutely free and we really need it right now. We really need some shares, folks. We really appreciate it. Show notes for this episode are at GOG.show slash 514. From there, you can find links to everything we talked about in this episode, as well as links to our swag and Discord channel if you want to buy some stuff or chat with us and other show fans. You can also head over to GOG.show slash contact and send us your feedback or questions that we can read on the air. And if you're so inclined, please head over to GOG.show slash review and toss us a snarky review and preferably five stars. Stay grumpy, my friends.